Hey everybody, how's it going? Welcome to One Life on Earth. My name is Kevin and today we're going to talk about how to climb Asatenango Volcano in Guatemala. It's the volcano that you climb to see Volcan del Fuego. That's the volcano that erupts. When we were there constantly, it would erupt like every 10 minutes. It's one of the coolest things I've ever seen. Oh, nice. Oh, that's Holy huge. Shit. That was huge. Oh, you can see the rocks flying. Oh my. See the rocks? Yeah. Those have got to be like boulders. Is that Seth Beck we're running outside, right? Oh, oh my move. god. <laughs> That's so sweet. Dude, it's huge. If you're thinking about going, make sure you do because you will not regret it. Side note, all of this information is available at onelifeonearth.com. Go to onelifeonearth.com, scroll right down here. This is my website. I have it as the very first thing here. Click that and this is the page that will explain everything I'm saying here, but in writing. So I know that when I was planning to go climb Asatenango, I had a lot of things that I couldn't really figure out logistically, like where to start, where the trail starts. Do you have to pay to be there? Can you park a car there? How long does it take? How hard is it? Is it hard? Is it easy? Can you do it in one day? Do you have to camp at the top? Where can you camp? What are the camping spots like? Do you have to pay for them? Do you have to find them? Can you just camp anywhere? How cold is it at the top? How cold is it at the bottom? What's the altitude like? Is it hard to climb in the altitude? How are the roads in Guatemala if you rent a car? What's the food situation there? How much water do you need to bring? What camping supplies do you need to bring? How many jackets? What type of boots do you need? All this stuff is kind of a lot of questions that I couldn't really find on the internet, but we did do it successfully, so I'm here to explain all this to you guys. And I think the best way to do that is to just tell you the story from our perspective, and then you can learn and everything you need to know. If you do have any questions, ask them down in the comments below and I'll get back to you. So we flew into Guatemala City, just a one runway airport. They have about, I don't know, 16 gates. So it's kind of a mid-level airport, not too big, not too small. You get out of the airport, you go right across the street to the rental cars. Michael, what do you think of the rental car? Old Red. She'll get the job done. If you've driven in other countries before, you'll be fine. If you're new to driving in other countries, it's a little bit different than America. The roads are a lot worse, depending on where you are. Some roads are good, some roads are bad. We started driving north right out of the airport in our car. Right when you get to this road here, you can see that it's red right now. It's like a constant traffic jam. It doesn't matter what time of day you're there. These cars are at a standstill all the time. So if you're trying to go somewhere fast in Guatemala City, it's not gonna happen. So keep that in mind and always plan for extra time if you're gonna drive anywhere. So you get through this stop and go traffic here, there is a Taco Bell. Get in my belly! Once you're done at Taco Bell, you're gonna keep going west, northwest, and it's gonna be stop and go traffic for the whole city here. Once you kind of get out of the city, it gets a little bit easier. I believe we arrived at the airport midday, so that's obviously not enough time to get to Asatenango Volcano and climb it that day. So the first night we were there, we got an Airbnb and slept there. You going? <laughs> just got in from night swimming. Uh, that was a good time, but now we gotta focus on tomorrow. Uh, we just got back from the market too earlier tonight. We picked up some of the essentials. Austin, why don't you uh, tell us what we picked up? Yeah, man, so just got back from swimming. It was pretty sweet. Uh, plan staying in a really sweet Airbnb for like 60 bucks a night, so definitely travel Airbnb if you're coming to Guatemala. But we made sure since we're going, since we're gonna be gone for two days, to get some bread uh, <laughs> and some PB and J. Unfortunately, the bread got kind of smashed in the car ride over here. It's kind of crazy in the streets of Guatemala. But we did get bananas as backup, so <laughs> <laughs> where'd the bottom go? But unfortunately, the bananas. <laughs> They fell off. They got messed up too. To try and get some good rest before the climb. Didn't happen for me. I actually woke up. I don't know if it was the food I ate or what, or maybe it was the altitude, but I woke up in the middle of the night and puked a whole bunch. <laughs> and I only slept like an hour or two. And this was the night before our hike. So it was not looking good right out of the gate for me. And, and uh, our friend Austin, he had to sleep on like this crooked, <laughs> He had to sleep on like this crooked cardboard bed. Toby's bed is at a 45 degree angle. <laughs> I got mine. And I brought this Just prop it. Just do it to prop it. <laughs> Damn it. 
so he was not too happy either. I don't know if my brother got a few hours of sleep or not, but the night before our hike did not go well. Maybe it'll go a little bit better for you guys. So we slept in Antigua, Guatemala. This is probably the closest place you'll get to the volcano that has Airbnbs or anything like that to stay. Otherwise, once you get more towards the volcano, the villages are really small and sparse and there's not a whole lot of uh, that type of lodging scenarios there. In Antigua, Guatemala, if you do drive in these back streets, that's where it gets kind of crazy. These roads are all cobblestone with like huge potholes and everything and people walking around and they're kind of really pretty hard to navigate. If you do go there, you should probably download the offline maps on Google so that you know like actually where you're going. Otherwise, you're probably gonna get lost. Anyway, the next morning when we woke up, we tried to wake up pretty early. I think we woke up around 5, 5 a.m. or 6 a.m., a little bit before the sun rose to give us enough time to get to the mountain. Uh, we knew we were gonna take some time to pack and and drink water and eat some food before the hike. So we tried to get up as early as possible. Getting up in the morning, we drove probably north on this road here and then down south. These highways up here are, you gotta be careful if you have a car because they're like kind of like interstates, but every once in a while there's a huge pothole that your car just nails going full speed. And I thought for sure we were gonna blow a tire like a bunch of times. We never did thankfully, but just keep an eye out for potholes on that road because it is pretty sketchy. So now the question is, this was the biggest question that I had was where does the trail start? And like, where does the trail start? Where do you park your car? So we figured that out. It is pretty much exactly north of the volcano, north of Asatenango. Right here, I have it marked. So here's Volcan de Fuego, Volcan de Asatenango. This is the one that you're gonna climb. Uh, right down here where I have this marked is where the trailhead is and that's where we parked our car. It is not really that obvious when you're there or when you're researching on the internet where exactly this starts. It's probably the most important information for you. Zoom in here. Uh, there's a shop called Shop Don Martin. This is kind of right where we parked. It's on a big hill. Uh, right where this car is here, that's where our car was. So. We left it there for two days and it was fine. The other confusing thing is there's kind of like two starts to, to the trailhead. There's basically two trailheads that they both merge into the same trail eventually after like half a kilometer or maybe a kilometer or more. They kind of weave through these fields. Basically, wherever you start, you're gonna weave into the main trail eventually. So you don't have to worry about too much. We did start right here but there is also a, I think like if you're on a tour, they mostly start right over here by these little tiny shacks right here. That's probably where you meet. That's where the bus would drop you off and you get in with a tour company or some people, tour guides or something, and they'll probably start right here. But we started right here. It's kind of like this big hill driveway thing. You walk up that, that turns into a trail. And as you can see, these two trails, they kind of merge together. I think we got lost and we like went up here somewhere. And then eventually we went left and got into uh, the main trail. If you don't know exactly where, you can, where you're going, there are farmers tending to their crops in these fields and you can kind of ask them. They'll help point you in the right direction. So referring back to my website, back when I looked all this information up, the trailhead is already at 7,800 feet. So you're pretty high up right at the start. So hiking immediately is not as easy as it would be somewhere where there's a lower elevation. So keep that in mind. Hiking is a lot more difficult. The more weight you have in your packs is a lot more difficult than it would be on flat ground or just lower elevation, even if you are going uphill. That's the other thing is this hike is uphill the whole way there's almost zero flat so you're going at an angle pretty much the whole hike so it is pretty hard we did carry a ton of weight because i had all of my camera gear film gear tents clothes food tons of water so it was really heavy and it was really hard because of the backpacks were so heavy so keep that in mind pack is low as you can, but it is a trade-off because it's cold on top of the mountain. You do need a lot of clothes if you're sleeping up there. Try to bring light, warm clothes if you can. So we're starting off at 7,800 feet right here. You're going up the trails. 
here's the main trail right here. And like I said, these trails kind of weave in and out at the beginning. There's a few different ones. They all kind of merge into the main one eventually once you get into the woods right about here. So you're hiking up the trail, hiking up the trail. You get to this place right here eventually after like maybe a couple hours. And inside of the woods here, there's like two little huts. And this is where there are apparently some guys there that check to see if you have, or a guide. We didn't really know what you had, what were the requirements to be here. We certainly, we did not have a guide. Talking to these guys, they told us that we needed a guide to go on the mountain. Didn't have one and we also didn't have any Guatemalan money. So there's really nothing we could do to appease him, but he did let us kind of just go through after a while of, after a lot of confusion and misunderstanding, he basically let us go through, but he might be there when you go telling you that you need a guide. If you can find a guide, we actually found some people from Germany later on in the trail. They said they talked to a guide right before they got to this connection point here. They talked to a guide. They said, can we just pretend that we're with you so we can get through this checkpoint here? And I think they let them just pretend that they were with that group. Once they got through here, then after that, they were fine. After that connection point, you're gonna go straight up the mountain. This is where it starts to get really hard. The altitude keeps getting higher and higher and the weight on your pack just keeps feeling heavier and heavier. There's less oxygen to breathe and everything is more difficult. After a few hours, you get around, you're getting closer to the top of the mountain. You're gonna wanna take a right here, head east around the mountain. You're not gonna go straight to the top right away. You're gonna go east, skirting the mountain on the east, probably a thousand feet from the top. So you're gonna go skirting on the east before you get to the top. The trail keeps going through the woods, through the woods. And this is the very first, once you get to the all the way to the east side, this is the very first time that you can actually see Volcan de Fuego. And the first time you see it is unbelievable. You will not forget. This thing explodes into the sky like a mini atom bomb. You can hear it, you can feel it. When it's a big one, you can, f when it's a really big one, you can feel it kind of hit your, the sound wave kind of hit your clothes. It's super epic, one of the coolest things I've ever seen in my life. My brother Michael and Austin, they both agreed with me. They thought this was insane. As you're coming around the edge here on the east, you're watching the volcano explode and eventually you get to the base camp area for Asatenango. Now once you're here at the base camp, this is where you're going to be camping if you're camping on top of the mountain. <clears throat> the way that the campsite is laid out is it's, it's on the edge of the mountain. So the camp spots are all basically built like little terraces in the exact same way that Machu Picchu is set up, how it's on the side of a hill, but you have little terraces everywhere. So you're going to be camp, you're going to be setting up your tent on a little edge like that. A lot of the camping spots are kind of operated by tour people. So they might already have like a little shack there or like the spot kind of cordoned off for them to use. But there are public ones that you can use for free. Basically the guys that go there all the time, the tour guys, they're just like, oh yeah, you can go right down there. There's a good spot for you down there. So that's what we did. We just found, it ended up being a really nice spot with a perfect view of the erupting Volcan de Fuego off in the in the distance there. Just amazing spot. When we set up our tent, we also set up a little fire. You are allowed to build fires there. Built a little fire to keep warm during the night and just sat there and watched the volcano explode all night. It was the coolest thing. And at night when it's pitch black out, you can see the lava just bright red and it's amazing. All night long, every 10 to 20 minutes, lava would just shoot out of the thing go down the side, bright red, under the stars. You got the fire there. It's like real life cowboy action. So we're chilling out on these terraces all day and then into the night. I'm taking photos all night long. We sleep for about, <laughs> here's the funny thing is we had a two person tent and three grown boys tried to cram into that two person tent. We also only had one sleeping bag and two sleeping pads because like I said, our backpacks were already super heavy and we had no room for anything else. So we had to just suffer with, we used one sleeping bag as a blanket and we both slept on the two or one and a half sleeping pads. Austin basically sat in his set against his backpack against the wall of the tent and just slept like this. 
And by sleep, I mean just sat there all night because pretty much none of us slept the whole night. Mostly because it was freezing cold and the high elevation kind of made it hard for us to sleep. But mostly because it was freezing cold. It's about, I do have a temperature gauge on my watch. So I took my watch off and monitored the temperature all night. It got to about 35 degrees, which is fine when you're just out walking around. But when you're trying to sleep, your body gets a lot less active and you get really cold a lot easier. So it was freezing during the night. We slept with all of our, we slept with our pants and all of our jackets and shirts and t-shirts on. We had gloves. You're going to want to bring gloves and a hat. If you don't have a hat while you're trying to sleep, you might get freezing. If you do have your own sleeping bag and own, own sleeping pad though you might be a lot better off than we were for food and water the way we managed the water was when we were in the parking spot with our car and during the drive there we were chugging water constantly to get pre-hydrated so that we were super hydrated before the hike so that we didn't have to bring so much water with us because water is like the most heavy thing you can bring probably six water bottles each we didn't end up end up using all six we probably only drank four water bottles per person during the hike so no matter what at least bring four bottles of water you will need four at least bring a lot of food too because you do get exhausted on the hike and once you're up on top of the mountain you're going to want to eat a lot of food in the morning for breakfast before you go back down there is a walmart down in guatemala city oh no did these expired like three days ago <laughs> what that's where we stocked up on food and water before we left. The top of the mountain is 13,000, 13,045 feet. If you go to my website here, you can see these pictures of the volcano erupting. Pretty freaking epic. This is the one of my brother, Michael, the morning that we woke up, the clouds. This is how much higher you are than the clouds. That's why it kind of shows how hard it is to breathe up there when you're trying to hike. Packs on because you're way above the clouds. Here's a picture of Austin jumping off a cliff jumping in uh, Lake Adelan. Super awesome lake. I'll probably make a separate separate video about that because that was a one of a kind adventure down there by Lake Adelan. If there's any more information you guys want to know, ask it in the comments below. We did stay at an Airbnb, like I said. It's haunted. I look over the doors, just creepy. <laughs> So if you want $30 off your first Airbnb, click on my link down below. I'll also put a link down for the boots that I always wear. I got these same boots for my brother. You're definitely going to want to bring boots on this trip. Don't try to do this hike with shoes. If you care about what altitude you're at, it's kind of interesting to see what altitude you're always at. This watch that I have tells the altitude. This is what I kept telling Austin and Michael. They kept asking me, what, what altitude are we at? I'll put that in the link too. That's about it, guys. If you want to check out the video about Lake Atlant, stay tuned. That's all for now. I'll see you guys out there.